Global Comparative Study on RED is CFORT's e efforts to support RED policy arenas and practitioner communities with information, analysis, tools. Are we making you all dizzy by this back and forth? It, there's a timer in the system, and, and we don't know how to turn it off, so it's, it's a little odd. But, but so the objective is to, to provide research results that, that, that inform the way RED is, is implemented and, and the way uh, policy is formulated so we can achieve what we call 3E e outcomes. And these are effectiveness, efficiency, and equity. And it's not just equity in, in, in terms of, 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 uh, of share of money or share of responsibility, but, but we want to see net benefits accumulate to key forest stakeholders who are being asked to do things differently in the way they, they access, use, and manage their forest resources. So this is the objective of what we're trying to achieve through the Global Comparative Study. And we have four modules in the study, four, four technical modules. One looks at um, uh, policy outcomes uh, from, uh, at the national level. Another one looks at, at Red Plus project uh, activities and demonstration activities at subnational and jurisdictional scales. Module three looks at measurement reporting and verification systems. Module four looks at, at uh, carbon management at the landscape scale. And we have a cross-cutting module on knowledge sharing because the knowledge that we generate, as this diagram shows, is aimed at, first of all, informing national red strategies and policies and informing national, uh, sub-national level project activities. And we, go, we do a lot of our work through the global red arena that's being organized in, within the UNFCCC. But our key objectives are to achieve change at na or support change at national and subnational levels. We're now in phase two and have been since 2013 looking at generating new knowledge to inform and facilitate the, the transformational change as countries move through the different phases of RED and, and begin to move from phase one, the readiness phase, into phase two, which is the, the, the early learning phase. Um, this, this study is being carried out in 14 countries and we've been working on it since 2009. The countries are, are spread out uh, fairly evenly between um, Africa, Latin America, and, and, and Southeast Asia, South and Southeast Asia. <clears throat> um, and the idea is that, it, is that RED is an urgent need of change in national policy arenas. And this is where, where change has to begin. And we, we talk about the idea of transformational change as a shift in discourse, attitudes, and power relations and a deliberate policy and protest action that leads policy formulation and implementation away from business as usual policy approaches that directly or indirectly support deforestation and forest degradation. Okay? So the idea is it, it, it's not just about, it, it's understanding some of the, the mechanisms and pathways to, to change are through discourses, through attitudes, and through power relations. Examples of these transformational change include um, uh, changes in economic, regulatory, and governance framework that include devolution of rights to local users, removals of pervasive incentives such as subsidies and concessions that serve selective economic interests and stimulate deforestation and forest degradation, or reforms of, of forest industry policies and regulations that effectively reduce unsustainable extraction and, and move this extraction to a sustainable uh, footing. Um, and we, we frame the policy framework in terms of four I's. So we had three E's at the beginning uh, as for our outcomes, but we look at this, this framework to, to change the, to, to bring about this transformational change through four I's. And these I's are institutions, interests, ideas, and information. And in the center of this diagram, you'll see a, a, an oval that says actors. And the whole point is that these actors need to, to have incentives to, to do things differently in these landscapes, to go from the business, the business as usual to the type of transformational change that is the objective of the, the policy process, in this case, RED. Um, so this policy process has, has outputs and policy decisions um, in, in, that affect broader policies and institutions because what happens in forest policy has uh, effects in other sectors. And that we have specific policies and measures around the forest resource itself. We also need administrative and technical information to implement policies because it's, it's, it's not just policies that count, it's, it's being able to take policies and implement them effectively. And so the outcomes we want to see are, are in terms of emissions, and, emissions reductions and removal and enhancement with respect to carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We want to see some outcomes that, that benefit livelihoods of local stakeholders, that benefit biodiversity, and that increase administrative and technical capacity. And the way to do that is through these four eyes through the ideas, the interests, which, which influence how actors um, uh, 
make decisions and, 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 and act on their, their resources. Also information, this is an important area that, that research, among other sources of information, can contribute. And we understand that the institutions frame the national policy framework. And in the case of RED, this national policy framework takes place not just within the country, but also within a global context of the international negotiations on RED. So this is a bit the theory of change that we've been exploring within the, this, this program, is understanding how, working, how, how ideas, interests, information, and institutions formulate the, the support for the status quo, but also how they can be used and, and acted upon to bring about the types of transformational change that countries are saying they want to achieve through their national red initiatives. Um, so how do the four eyes hinder and, and, or enable change? Well, there's what we call institutional stickiness, where formal power uh, typically rests within the stickiest organizations, the organizations that, that, that are, resist, are able to resist change and that have enough influence to resist change, while new institutions and actors are often ignored or remain isolated. Um, and, and, uh, and so uh, ministries responsible for natural resources are, are, are um, some examples of, of, of institutions that, that may have interests or, or may, may provide resistance to, to change. Ideas, if we look at the state's interest in social and economic welfare, that, that can fall short if a lack of autonomy from interests that drive deforest and degradation. So for example, rent seeking, fraud and collusion, corruption practices inside bureaucratic system all lead to, to situations that, that um, hinder the, the, the transformational change that we're trying to, to bring about, and overcoming these, putting in place incentives that, that, that um, reduce the rent seeking and, and, and uh, promote the, the, the action of, of these actors to act in, in, on behalf of the whole society, reduce this, this uh, stickiness and, and enable the transformational change. <clears throat> With ideas, that ref it's uh, related to discourse that affects policy making. They frame the problem, how the problem is presented, and they, they present a limited choice of, of what is reasonable and, and what's put forward as, as what's possible. Okay, so for example, red benefits for those who contribute to efficiency and effectiveness is one of the discourses that's out there versus a benefits to those who have moral rights to ba based on equity considerations, right? So you, you hear a lot of, of discussion in the international community around who should get the payments, and is it is it should we be paying actors that are currently acting in negative ways that are degrading the resource, or should we be, we be paying those who are the good stewards of the resource? So beginning to, to begin to understand some of these relationships and sort this out is another objective of what we're trying to do through our, our research and, and understanding of ideas. Then there's information. There's facts. Ra facts, rather than speaking for themselves, are often selected by different actors for, to support the, their own positions and their own interests. Um, and so, so research can help put them in contests in ways that, that reflect the interest and information of, of the provider. And, and, and b if we can understand how the different stakeholders are using these ideas, we can not only validate their, their positions within these, these policy frameworks and, and, and policy forums, but we can begin to examine them and have them examined by, by different stakeholders um, to, to, to try and promote not only understanding, but a basis for common understanding, which would lead to the types of change. <clears throat> I just want to point out that, that C4 has published its third book in, in our uh, series of our edit series on, on RED. Um, and it, uh, it was released uh, in the middle of last year on um, uh, analyzing RED, which is the results of the, the research that has taken place within the global comparative study on RED. Our two previous books were, were more prospective. This one is, is, is looking at uh, what our research results are telling us as the community moves through it. Thank you very much. Now I'd, I'd like to introduce the panel. So to my right is Monica De Gregorio, who is a professor at the University of Leeds. And Monica will be presenting some work on, on the challenges and opportunities for countries to progress with RED um, and, and some of the results that we've, we've looked at on countries that have been successful or less successful in, in moving from phase one into to phase two. Um, Moira Moilino, immediately to my left, will be is a C4 researcher. We'll be talking about uh, some of the challenges across levels of governance, across uh, sectors, um, in, in achieving red and, and coordination, um, and bringing in some of the perspectives with respect to the landscape approach, where it's, it's not just what happens within the forestry sector that's required to, to achieve the, the types of changes, but really how forests interact with a whole host of other players and interests in, in landscapes. Um, Paiman Santoso um, will be talking um, 
about the, the experiences that, that Florida has had and, and has been had within the Ministry of Forestry on the one map and the map issues associated with um, uh, deforestation and land use in general in, in Indonesia. Um, Pak uh, Darsano Hartano uh, will talk about uh, project challenges, uh, financing issues, and problems with performance uh, measurement uh, um, performance measurement at, at the project level. So we'll hear some some international comparative analyses, some national comparative analyses, and some subnational experiences in the, these sets of talks. Each speaker will have about 10 minutes to present, and then we'll move to a panel discussion. And we really like interactive um, discussions with the audience. So. If the discussion fails, I will ask some questions, but I would really prefer to have my intervention limited to what I've just already said and, and, and then facilitating the rest of the discussion. So let me ask Monica to, to, to kick off with, with her presentation. And <clears throat> you have your microphone. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Oh. All right. So. I will try in, in my time to give you a little bit of an idea of uh, the results from the comparative analysis we did on national policy processes. Um, so we started uh, to look at, first of all, policy context within red plus countries to assess what the institutional conditions, the politician, policy conditions were that could facilitate red. Then we looked at a much more detailed analysis in 12 countries, uh, and we used qualitative comparative analysis to assess progress in terms of policy progress and which conditions and determinants actually are most important in determining progress in these countries. And we identified both institutional, so remote conditions that are difficult to change in the short run, and more approximate policy conditions that relate to actions of policy actors. And the third type of comparative analysis was to look at public discourses on RED and see the extent to which policy makers and policy actors speaking in the media, what kind of ideas and solutions for RED were they actually advocate, advocating and to what extent are these actually driving towards uh, policy reforms that are needed for effective, equitable, and efficient red outcomes. So I start with some results from the policy context analysis, and I will give you some results from a qualitative comparative analysis, and I will close with some results on the media analysis. In terms of policy context analysis, we investigated seven different countries. We looked at drivers of deforestation, and we looked at the policy landscape. We looked for policies that are potentially supporting red. And here we have the results for the three Asian countries. And one example that was mentioned this morning already for Indonesia that is a supporting policy is, for example, the moratorium on grant granting new licenses in primary forest and peatlands, which has been uh, implemented in 2011 and has been now renewed until 2015. Similarly, in Nepal and Vietnam, we also find policies supporting RED. We, there is a law in Vietnam on payments for environmental services related to forests, and there are a number of subsidies for energy efficiency and to try to reduce firewood collection in Nepal for smallholders. On the other hand, there are big challenges uh, that are linked to development because we have a number of policies that actually clash with red objectives. And these are, for example, in Indonesia, regulations that support the pulp and paper industries, uh, the regulation that allow mining in protected areas, and fiscal and non-fiscal subsidies for uh, food estate, uh, biofuel development, and oil palm. In Nepal, it's the, these clashing policies are more linked to agricultural modernization and infrastructure development. And the same is true in Vietnam. Infrastructure development is the biggest, if you want, challenge for implementing RED. So clearly, to actually have effective national RED policies, we need a state that is able to harmonize these policies with RED objectives. And this will happen if we have a state that is relatively autonomous from special interests in the economic sectors. And 
in the fourth column, we, we assess the lack of uh, or the level of autonomy of the state vis-a-vis uh, -vis these interests. And for all the three Asian countries we investigated, we found quite high, medium to high levels of lack of autonomy for different reasons. So we are starting from a policy context which makes transformational change quite challenging. So this is the starting point. Now, next we looked at, well, assessing progress in red countries and we compared 12 different countries. To assess progress, we need an outcome variable. What is progress on red in national policy processes at the moment? We can't measure outcomes in terms of emission reduction at the moment, but we looked at countries that have moved from phase one to phase two, and that is having national red plus strategy in place and starting the implementation process. Out of the 12 countries that we investigated, so far, three of them were judged uh, to actually have achieved um, progress. And these are Brazil, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And the way that we define progress is the establishment of comprehensive policies that are targeting transformational change in red plus policy domain. So what are the determinants of these progress? So we try to look at which variable can actually explain the different paths that all these 12 countries uh, have undertaken to achieve or not progress in red. And this, was, this is based on uh, country teams, policy context analysis that took a couple of years, and a series of workshops where a number of indicators were identified. We started with 30. And we then, through expert uh, advice, arrived to six key indicators, three of which are linked to institutional context, and these are the pressure on forest, effectiveness of policy governance, and the existing of pre-existing uh, policies that reduce deforestation or that tackle climate change. Three other variables relate to policy processes, so the actions of policy actors within uh, policy decision processes. And these are the level of national ownership, so the extent to which domestic actors are driving red policies, the presence of political coalitions that are driving for transformational change and policy reforms, and the level of inclusiveness in policy processes. And the results in terms of remote conditions, uh, if you look at the red area, Indonesia, Vietnam, Brazil, and Bolivia actually um, were able to uh, satisfy most of the pre-existing conditions. Brazil and Bolivia satisfy all three. Vietnam does not have very, uh, very strong pressure from forests, but satisfies the other three. And Indonesia still has lack uh, of implementation in terms of forest governance. But what we see comparing these institutional conditions is that what is key for progress is number one, pre-existing policies that address uh, or want to reduce deforestation or that are linked to climate change objectives. And in addition to that, either high levels of uh, deforestation and pressure on forests or a certain level of effectiveness in uh, forest governance. So when these institutional conditions are met, it is easier for countries to actually make progress in terms of national policy development towards uh, red. In terms of the proximate conditions, uh, as I said, we have national ownership, inclusive, policy processes and the presence of coalition for change. And Brazil is the only country that actually satisfies all three of these criteria. Vietnam does not have very inclusive policy processes but has uh, quite strong national ownership and also coalitions for transformational change. And the same is true for Indonesia. So strong ownership and, and coalition for change. And what that tells us is that Enabling con institutional conditions are not enough for progress towards effective red policies. But if 
institutional, uh, institutions are in place that support RED, then what is crucial is to have domestic actors leading the process and uh, transformational coalitions. So po political coalitions that push for policy reforms. Just a few words on the results of the media analysis. Uh, we investigated, uh, we looked at articles in the media in seven countries and looked at statements by policy actors, uh, so either quotes or paraphrases on RED, and looked at how they portrayed and understood RED and what kind of policy directions they were suggesting. And what we found is that by far the dominant discourse, not just at the start of, of you know, 2007, 2008, but even today, is still about simplistic win-win scenarios about red. And the concern for that, about that, is that public debates around the drivers of deforestation are missing in many ways. And these are really the debates that should happen to move red forward. On the other hand, what is encouraging is that there is quite a lot of debate on the need for institutional governance reforms. Now, discourses on transformational change do exist in public discourses, but they are minority discourses. And the actors that mainly put them forward are domestic non-governmental organizations and civil society organizations. And what they highlight are the risks and the trade-offs that RED might entail um, in terms of trade-offs between RED and economic development, but also the possibility of limiting resource access and affecting negative livelihood strategies at the local level. And so they draw attention to the need of ensuring safeguards, for example. And the second aspect that they look at is they question ex existing power structures um, they ask for empowerment of uh, groups that have not much say in policy processes and warn about the power of particular economic interests. And so, to conclude, um, what these comparative studies show are that, first of all, relative autonomy of the state towards specific uh, economic interests that drive deforestation is important to be able for the state to discipline the sector and revise, if you want, uh, policies. Existing policies and commitment of governments to address deforestation and concerns about climate change facilitate the development of red policy, especially in countries where you have high pressure of deforestation or where you have some effective enforcement of uh, forest governance. National ownership is key and political coalition that push for policy reforms are necessary to actually move forward the process. And so just two key messages that we draw out of these studies is that Number one, we need to draw back attention to the drivers of deforestation and how to address them in policy reforms. And to do that, we need to now start that we start having some red plus strategies to actually look at how to integrate red aims into sectoral policies. So policy harmonization and policy integration. We also need to bring to the table and to the debate actors that are actually driving deforestation and forest degradation. And we have not seen in our policy analysis that these actors are engaged or were engaged in the first place in the development of threat strategies. And we need to engage them in order to be able to have compliance as well as uh, for these uh, red policies. And finally, a call from um, mainly the NGO sectors and concerns about trade-off, about ensuring equity and safeguards at the national level. And so for those that are interested here, there are the studies that you can, if you're interested in reading more, and just a word of acknowledgement because comparative analysis would not have been possible with country teams in 12 countries. I can't read all the names, but it's been a global effort, I can say. And Thank you, Monica. 
But it is, it is indeed quite, a, quite an effort, and I, I think it's, it's interesting to see what has predisposed certain countries to uh, getting through the, the readiness phase and, and being sort of the early enters into, the, the, into phase two. I guess some of the interesting questions now are, are how do we attack some of these challenges that you've raised, that the need to, for countries to get realistic about the drivers of deforestation to engage constructively with, with those, those actors. And I think that brings us very nicely to, to the next presentation from uh, Moira Moiliono who will be talking to us a bit about the, the, the cross-sectoral and, and cr uh, challenges that are cross-sectoral and challenges that are across levels of governance in, in countries and how countries are, are dealing with them within the, the red mechanism. So Moira, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So my talk is, uh, like I said, like Lou said, it's about the challenges to, uh, to the how of RADD to the cross-sectoral and uh, cross-scale information uh, arena. First, I would like to talk a little bit about the background, and then I go into three examples of uh, cross-level uh, information exchange, and then I'll close with the discussion. Uh, we are all here because RADD is not a simple thing, it, and if it was simple, we wouldn't be here. So I call the RADD a wicked problem, a problem where the boundaries are not clear, there is no one solution, and it requ requires an, an co co coherent effort and an integrated effort. So climate change itself is a wicked problem, so RADD within it becomes also a wicked problem. And in a wicked problem, which requires multi-stakeholders, we need an information to uh, bring all the stakeholders together. And the collection and sharing of data for the information is actually the nut and bolts of the RADD mechanism. So again, information is key. The first example is about the cross-scale information flow. The cross-scale here means a national the provincial uh, arena of information flow. So on the right is the uh, is what happens at the provincial level. On the left is what happens on national level. If you uh, in policy network analysis, we have come up with uh, eight clusters which you cannot really see. But it shows that within the information exchange, the one that plays the biggest role are state actors. Is this? Is this? Oh, sorry. It's, it's, these, these are, these are on the side. So this goes forward. Yeah, yeah, but I mean uh, the pointer. There's no pointer. OK. okay. This, this should be the pointer. Yeah, but if you point, if you point there, they're not going to see it. OK, no pointer. You just have to, fo to, to believe me when I say that state actors are the most important people. <laughs> and that NGOs play a, an important role, but they are not important in uh, policy making. It doesn't work on these fields. We are too, too modern. But uh, there is a... There is a, a gap between the information flow between provincial and national levels. But there are people that play, or actors that play a brokerage role, that pass on the, the information towards between these two levels. And in, uh, in, in this picture you can see these numbers, which, uh, uh, I forgot my English which uh, coincide with the figures, with the explanation below. And it shows that the Minister of Forestry is one of the most important brokers. The Nature Conservation and the FFI are two big conservation NGOs. They play also a big uh, brokerage role. And in the provincial level, most of the information on RADD will be passed through the provincial office the Kalimantan Planning Office, which sits in the office of the province. However, like I said, state actors are the most powerful actors connecting across scales. So we depend on the government to give information to other actors on RDD. 
NGOs play an important brokerage role, but they are not very power, powerful. They are not really influencing po policy, but they keep other NGOs informed. While uh, the domestic non-state actors, the NGOs which are on the domestic level, the local NGOs, they do not have the cap capacity to really access the information which is at the national level. But uh, because of that, uh, because of the control of the central and provincial state actors in information flow, they carry with it a, a, a responsibility to make sure that this information is passed to the non-state actors. So again, to, uh, to have a multi-stakeholder forum, to have everybody informed, will be the responsibility of the state because they uh, play the brokerage role. Then we have an, uh, an, another example which talks about uh, sectors. And we use the example of a, 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 a piece of research that we have recently done on the integration of adaptation and mitigation. Uh, synergies between adaptation and mitigation is something now everybody is talking about and uh, is needed. Uh, and we used the, the, the studies of Vietnam and Indonesia, a comparative study to show what is uh, actually happening where the policies are in place, and where they do talk about integration. Uh, in both these countries, there are different uh, policies. And uh, you, as you can see, they are often split into adaptation uh, policies and mitigation policies, but also in both, which cover both adaptation and mitigation. I'm not going to, to read all this. Uh, things, but the point is adaptation needs to be uh, synergized with mitigation. The actors think that it's necessary. Policies are in place which really say that policy needs to be integrated with adaptation, but there is no clear guidance and emphasis to integrate these two. So it's set, but there is no guidance for it. And uh, furthermore, in practice, they are seldom addressed jointly because political priorities favoring one approach or the other. So in Vietnam, they talk more about adaptation, in Indonesia, more about mitigation. And uh, while there is a lot of effort to bring the two together, in practice, they are, they are not brought together. Then, uh, the policies are often done by different agencies. Mitigation is at one agency and adaptation in one agency. And even with, if they are within an agency, they are in two different departments. And, and both at the agency level and in the department, there is competition and weak coordination. And again, this is a matter also of, also of information flow not happening. Then there is low uptake of national polit political commitments on adaptation and mitigation at a lo uh, local level. And what is more important perhaps is difference in of funding stream. Because in Indonesia we have a national strategy which really said that adaptation is uh, to be mainstreamed, but, it, but the funding for adaptation and mitigation is still uh, different. The last uh, example is information among policy actors. Um, the example taken from these two publications. Uh, what we did was doing a policy an analysis network asking actors with whom they exchanged uh, information on a routine basis. And then we analyzed the reciprocity among these actors. So if one actor said they uh, Inf exchange information, we ask for confirmation of the other side. If you look at it, then it turns out that there are three different clusters of where information exchange happens on a reciproc reciprocal basis. There is the donor transnational national NGO clusters. They are sitting together and talking among themselves. There's the national government cluster, which also sits together and talks a lot about them, uh, a lot with themselves. There is the uh, local NGO, the Civil Society Forum for Climate Justice, which is a forum of different NGOs, so uh, it's logical that they also talk to themselves. And then there's only two private sector organizations which are a bit uh, isolated. 
And within these two big clusters, there is uh, two organizations which forms a bridge. So they play uh, a role to, uh, to cross information, to bring information from one cluster to the other. So has information been exchanged? And we are all in agreement, right? We all know about red, and we all do it. And who is then actually missing? We saw that only two uh, actors of the private sectors were visible. And who are they? Actually, they're both a little bit of a communication forum like the Climate Center of Justice. But uh, what we are missing is the palm oil and mining companies whose activities in practice continue to lead to deforestation, forest degradation, although there is an effort to, uh, to like we heard this morning, to uh, uh, de decrease it. There are also companies who just uh, pursue business as usual where climate change is not part of their uh, policies and maybe they don't care or they don't know. But there are also the green strategists who have developed environmental friendly program as part of their corporate social responsibility strategies and there are more and more of these kinds. But there are also the carbon money makers who seek opportunities in the carbon markets. And then there are the consultants or the researchers. We are, uh, like CIFAR is not really a business company, but we, we can be uh, in included in this part. We provide advice, advice on how to build and work with REDD. So in short, uh, in our uh, research, we see that all actors say they exchange information with others. And there are so many workshop meetings on REDD, such as these, and there's a lot of funding. And so there are opportunities to build networks. But in all these uh, talks and all about the information exchange, the prominence of government uh, agencies is still very high. So we talk about multi-stakeholders, we say inclusive development, but when it comes uh, to making a decision, we look to the government. Then there is a clear homophily where organizations uh, talk only within each other, uh, government with government, business with business. And we are wondering why this is so. And it might be that they are not aware of each other in the terms of aware of each other's activities in REDD. Or they are not considered that important in the decision making. So whether they give us information or we give them information doesn't really matter. Or uh, there is also something which is there is no respect because in, uh, in practice the government really doesn't really ex respect the local communities because they are unaware and lack knowledge and capabilities. So what are the challenges? Uh, one of the big challenges is that there are different funding streams for each sector or actor. So if the funding is not the same, we don't exchange information. So NGOs because they are dependent on one donor, uh, sometimes or often are required to exchange information. There's a lot of talking and discuss discussion about integration, about inclusiveness, and, uh, and multi-stakeholders, but this is not really real realized in actions, not even in information exchange. Nevertheless, there is progress at the national level, and there's also integration at the local level, but it's still not enough for, uh, and there is the progress at uh, the one map policy, the moratorium, the institutions. But again, when information exchange is mostly within actor groups, can then collaboration exist, real collaboration? And does it mean, one, and what does it mean for transformational change? Because transformational change requires the information which up to now is still not exchanged fully. And that is it. I, thank you. Thank you, Moira. Well, we've... we've can, can, okay. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> very good. So informational exchange is, is incomplete at the moment and, and very necessary. And I think we're going to talk... The, the next presentation will talk a bit about a, a, a major effort to exchange information. The, the, the one map policy within uh, Indonesia has been a major component of the, the National Red uh, actions 
to try and, and put land use and land use planning all across ministries, all on the same footing, all working with the same map, all, all working off of the, the same understanding of allocation of, of land resources. So Paliman Santoso will share with us some of the, the Indonesian experiences at information sharing to build some of these cross-institutional linkages that we've just heard are, are very important for success of, of a national red policy. Paliman? Do you have your presentation? It's in, it's in the back. <clears throat> Do we have any tweets that have come in for any of the speakers so far? Any questions? Not yet. Do we have any questions from the, from the floor for, for anything that you've heard so far? Let's take one over here. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Thomas Entis. I work for UNEP for the UN RED program and I'm based in, in Bangkok. Um, my question is basically for the, for the first speaker. Um, there's two, two issues. Uh, one is when, when you look at the progress that, uh, that you showed us in some of the countries, I'm wondering whether you also looked at the role of donor funding because some of these countries have received a lot of funding. I'm, I'm doing some work in Vietnam, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of money here in Indonesia, and I think some of the other countries you have looked at have not received that. So in the country there's not that much uh, interest, uh, would be my hypothesis. And then I think, and I hope I didn't misunderstand that, you had a slide there on land, uh, on clashing, on policies clashing uh, with Red Plus and supporting Red Plus. And I think for Vietnam, you said that actually land allocation is clashing with Red Plus, if I didn't mis misread that slide. Could you clarify uh, whether I either misread that? Because we in the UN Red program in Vietnam, we are supporting land allocation, so I'm now wondering whether there's, we, we are making a mistake. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, we didn't specifically look at the amount of funding for different countries, but clearly um, countries that uh, have received a lot of funding have uh, better opportunities to move ahead with RED because they have the funds for readiness activities, even building capacity and so on. And certainly, all, I mean, Indonesia and Vietnam have received a lot of funding. Brazil, on the other hand, has really started RED by themselves with their own system. That said, they also have collected quite a lot of international funding. but. What we see is that the countries that have made most progress are countries where national governments are serious about RED and are actually driving the process. In countries where it is the international community that is driving the process and governments are not so convinced yet, progress is much slower. And so it, it's not going to happen, especially when we think later on in implementation. Um, so and, and it, it is also in part linked to lack of capacity in certain countries and what needs to happen in, in order to um, build more capacity. Um, but national ownership seems to be more important than the actual flows of money. In terms of the Vietnam case, what I said in terms of uh, policies that are uh, clashing with RED is mainly the idea of self-sufficiency in food, and so the need to produce food internally. Um, actually, the land law was, I, I think, listed as one of the laws supporting, um, so that was in the other column, yeah. Uh, there's less pressure from logging in, in Vietnam, in, uh, so that is n because Vietnam is one of the few countries that ac is actually reforesting. Uh, and where there's very little logging going on. Yeah, thank you very much. There, 
uh, some of the logging is, I think, just happening in the neighboring countries. But I now have a microphone which I'd like to pass on. Okay, I, I think we're, we're ready now for the, the next presentation because we'll, we'll pick this up shortly. Um, but I, I think so, these questions are interesting. But, but we wanted to, to come back now to the question of information sharing and sharing information across uh, government agencies and, and across levels of governance. So, so Pai Imam will, will now explain to us the Indonesian experience with the one map policy, which is, a, as I said, an integral part of what Indonesia is doing, the measures that Indonesia is putting in place to implement RED. Thanks, Lou. Uh, first of all, I would like to explain that it's not from the result of the research, but it's uh, what I'm to what I'm going to present in this uh, moment is that it's from my experience when working with mapping units, and also what I learn, what I hear from the uh, from the workplace. Uh, for this, uh, my presentation which will not as systematically presented as Moira and uh, Monica did, uh, but uh, I'll try to, my, to do my best by trying to explain what's happened behind the, 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 the issue that's now uh, some, to some extent is not supporting to the implementation of the RED. It began with the, the late 1980s when there is no comprehensive spatial plan in all provinces of Indonesia. When the competing land use is very high, we have a development of transmigration for more than 5,000 kepala keluarga or family to be transmigrated to outer island of Java. And we also have a problem with food and uh, development of estate crop and also the concession for timber, etc. And uh, we need at the time that we have to save our forest. And then uh, by then the Ministry of Forestry, sorry, the Ministry of Agriculture where the Sec Director General of Forestry is under that ministry, have the policy to have the consensus among land-based development uh, institution in the province to make a spa, uh, claim of the forest of the land that should be maintained as a forest land, and fortunately, it 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 is uh, mandat mandated by the Forestry Act number five, 1967. So by this mandate, uh, forestry sector uh, asked to other sectoral, land based sectoral development to make a consensus which of the area within the province to be reserved as a forest area. That's the, the start of what we call Tata Guna Hutan Kesepakatan or consensus, consensus forest land use plan. And the consensus uh, have uh, decided that we have to conserve protection forest and conserve conservation forest which has been have been in the Dutch have been allocated with uh, in the Dutch administration era because we believe that the allocation is right and there is no uh, complaint from the other sectors and no complaint from the community and the second uh, we also realized that there are many uh, areas that has a steep terrain by using a very simple criteria of protection forest, which is uh, we include the variable of terrain, soil type, and rain intensity, we categorize some uh, some area as a protection forest to pre to protect the water and soil system. And then uh, by law, we have to maintain the lock-in concession that is legally been there. So. That kind of area that has been granted for logging concession is maintained as a production forest. And the other forest that is suitable for other uses were allocated as comfortable production forest, which is allocated for other development. The map of the consensus forest land use planning, we considered it as a very macro and indicative 
in the sense that it's only based on the best available data and techniques. At the time, in 1980s, we have only map from the aviation map from the US, dated 1948. That's the best map we have of, uh, at the time, and also topographical maps that is administered by the Army, Indonesia. And we don't have remote sensing technique, we don't have GIS techniques, and we still using, what's that, typewriter instead of computer. So there is very limited resource and limited technique at the time, but we have to make it. Because if not, we will lose our forest. And uh, it's only in the scale of one to four, 500,000, and no preliminary field assessment, it's just only a map study, on desk study, no check in, in the field, and not accurate, of course. But this is the best solution in the absence of spatial plan. And we proud of that because, because of the existence of consensus for a land use plan, it's uh, was that something like supporting or making the idea of we should have a spatial plan in province and national level. There are some issues on that. Uh, the first is that many many wrong classified as forest area, while those that suitable were not included in the forest. That's the in uh, unaccurateness of the map, and then there is. After that, in the 1990s, abundant and more accurate data from various imageries has improved the quality of information and scale of map. But on the other hand, the updated information raised a different scale and oops, sorry, and created different interpretation. So there, there are many trade-offs in, in the development and conservation things that was uh, raised uh, that that has not been raised before. Now, after we have a uh, accurate and good information and uh, re resource for the mapping, we have uh, some dispute, some debate on this. Next, uh, the other things that uh, it's not good in the in the sense of the social things. Community land are not depicted and their right is less appreciated by that land. At that time, when the new order is still in the power, there is no, there is no one pro protest on this. But now uh, we have a problem with the conflict in the field because of the uh, community land is not appreciated in the, in the planning. And uh, other things, mining is not included in the in the spatial plan, meaning that the the sector has the right to mine everywhere. Exclude it's only excluded in the conservation and protection forest. Of course, it 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 raises a debate and dispute over forest area boundary between district and district and central government, community and concession holder, and among adjacent local government. There is risk on that uh, because uh, it will something like uh, uh, hinder the good planning in the in, in the province. So uh, there is need, of course, a protocol to reconsolidate all information, all new information to review or refine the spatial take, spatial plan. Residency. We see that it, the agency will, will, will have a function to broker and bridge the actors in the debate and, and, debate and dispute. And of course, uh, there will be a good uh, chance, a good opportunity for the agency to develop new schemes of uh, spatial plan, new framework, and new paradigm on the forest. And uh, to ensure that the performance of red once we are going to implement it. Uh, it's a need, there's a need of consensus, another consensus on the measurement techniques because uh, some of the measurement techniques we develop in the, uh, now is to some extent is not uh, fit with the actual condition in the field. And one map policy will, should be implemented 
and it will be used in the all jurisdiction for measuring performance indicators and green development. That is the summary that what I feel in the in the field and also in the work uh, con, uh, regarding the maps uh, in the relation of the implementation of FRED. Thank you, Lou. Thank you very much. Okay, very interesting challenges, um, and and uh, I think very useful experience. I, I think other countries are, are wrestling with similar types of issues, and and you know improving technology, improving understanding, and, and, and trying to to get everyone on the same page. Our final talk is is sort of the next level down in in spatial scale, and perhaps the next level up in complexity. Um, Pat Darsono Hartano will talk to us a bit about project level experiences where all this actually comes together on the ground to, to achieve a change in the way forest resources are being used on the ground. So where all this national policy process, all of this information sharing comes together, some things really have to change on the ground. And this is where, where we run into reality and, and, and the difficulties with financial flows, the difficulties with, with interest, the difficulties with, with getting things to change um, compared to the status quo. So we'd, we'd like to hear your experiences and, and the, the, the lessons that you're drawing from your experiences that could be taken on by others so not everybody has to reinvent the wheel. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Selamat siang, Bapak-Bapak dan Ibu-Ibu sekalian. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here today. I'm, uh, I think uh, given that I was, I'm given the opportunity to speak last, and hopefully I can get some whatever it's everybody said, which I think it's a, you know, it's it's it it's a very interesting because uh, you know I know I was told that I have to put this four I together, you know, the institution, the interest, the idea, and information. Um, I think this, you know, since I'm we are the only here. I'm a private. We are the private sectors. Um, I'm you know we're from a company called PT Rimbar Mahmur Utama. Uh, some of you might have known, that basically we are the Red Plus project developers. Um, I have started this business in 2007, so this is my seventh year now, I guess. Um, it's, uh, you know, this, is, um, this presentation today, I want to tell and share with everybody the challenges that we have in terms of getting a Red Plus project together. So, um, um, as uh, you, I mean, everybody's, I'm, I'm sure now, compared to six, seven years ago, people know what Red Plus is. So if you look at in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the opportunity to do Red Plus is people, like, uh, which I still believe is to actually do it in peatlands, where it contains the most carbon stocks. It's uh, under a lot of pressure and threat for conversion. And uh, it should create more benefit uh, because given the biodiversity that it has. So if you look at the, the key fact is Indonesia have 22 million hectares of peatland or approximately 12% of its land, but it's uh, amounted almost half of the emissions. So if we can actually con basically conserve our peatlands, we should be able to, to, re to reduce our emissions significantly. So I'm just trying to give you, this, uh, the picture here is, uh, you know, if you look at the peatlands in Indonesia, you can see some of them in the, in the Sumatra, the eastern border of Sumatra, the southern part of Kalimantan, and some part of Papua. But our project itself, just to show you a picture, just uh, to zoom in, that's, uh, that's center Kalimantan. And um, the, area, the area itself is, uh, I mean, the company is called PT Riba Mamurutama. The area is about 200,000 hectares. So just to give you a comparison, 200,000 hectares is about three times the size of an island of Singapore. Um, you know, it has almost 90% of the area, all of this area is production forest and it's a peatland forest as well. Uh, as Pa uh, Iman mentioned, there is a you know, production forest that can be converted earlier. Uh, so basically, you know, um, the, there's a yellow color and an orange color seen here. The orange color, sort of like a pinkish color, that's the area that is considered this is zoned as convertible produ produ production forest. What that means is uh, basically this is an area that can be converted into palm oil. So if you look at in terms of the, 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 area, the forest cover itself, um, it's still in very good condition, only about 12% that are non-forest. And uh, it's located in Santa Kalimantan. It's in the district of um, Kota Waringin Timur and Katingan. So if you look at the two river system on the east and on the west, that's where the whole area is, originally for 200,000 hectares. 
So if you look at the business of as usual scenario, it's quite simple. Uh, you know, the pinkish color that you see can be converted to palm oil. The northern part of the area that I stayed, you know, that I show you on the map, it actually there's some there are a lot of mining activities that's ongoing. So you got, that's another uh, things that happen. So basically, there's a large scale forest conversion into palm oil or pulp and paper, as well as uh, as as well as mining. Um, just want to give you an example, um, not an example, an illustration of uh, this is a studies that uh, WWF did uh, in terms of the forest cover in Borneo, Kalimantan. This is in 1985. Then this is year 2000. This is year 2010. If you look at some of the area, you know, and then this is year 2020 that projected, which I think is much, given that we have all this red plus activities and moratorium, it's much better. It should be much better than this. But I want to show you a picture. This is 2010, where I sort of zoom in where it is. Uh, if you look at 2010 versus 2020, which I'm going to show you next, that area is gone. So hopefully with our activities, what we want is to, to, to have what we call ecosystem restoration license. And get this license, we are not allowed to lock until, you know, at all. I mean, not, not to, allowed to lock until we reach, until we reach a, Bio, you know, basically a stable condition, which what they, it's still not defined properly. But that's the illustration that I'm, I can show you. And um, again, just uh, you know, the license itself, it's called ecosystem restoration license. It was uh, law was created in 2007, revised in 2008. It's actually for private sector. This is a very good regulation in terms of policy for Indonesia have created. This is this policy was created even prior to Bali COP. So Indonesia at that time were will, will in the forefront of you know, basically trying to protect and conserve forests. And um, you know, this is, it, it, it makes total sense from a private sector perspective because it has that 60 years of permanency in terms of licensing. And then you know, it uh, gives the, the, uh, the, the company the rights to manage the, the, the area. Have that, uh, also stated that rights to sell carbon credit and then uh, you know we don't have to lock. We just we can always conserve and restore. So uh, this is definitely a good and very effective policy for a red plus project developers. So you know I mean it showed the additionality because of the production forest as well as the permanence because it's 60 years and um, possibility of 35 years extension. The first uh, concession was given to Harapan Rainforest. Um, that was I believe in year 2008. But um, what I want to share with everybody today is basically from the licensing perspective. Indonesia, I think, you know, as a private project developers or private sectors, we need to get a license to manage forest land. So the journey start for us, for me personally, in 2008, where basically we start applying for the concession. If you look at, if, you know, in terms of the policy, this is a good policy to protect to conserve, and you think that you should get the license very quickly if, you know, if we want to get it uh, to, do, to do the proper thing. Unfortunately, we have a problem, just like you know, I mentioned, institution, we have interest, we have idea, we also have information. These are the things, the challenge that we see. So if you look at the, you know, we submitted application in May 2008. Uh, by, by May, by a year later, 2009, finally, the minister has designated our area as a concession. Uh, basically, what we call what we do is um, the the minister assign our they give us assign an area that this can be allocated for concession or ecosystem concession. So you know, if you look at the process, the next process is you know as we move in May 2009 as well. We you know we give our presentation to the Ministry of Forestry. You know, basically we are applying for 200,000 hectares. They you know it's a big room of everybody from each cross from the Director General of Production Forest and other Director General as well that are present, uh, that are present at that time and we give a long presentation. And then our proposal is approved in June 2009. In June 2009, the minister wrote us a letter saying that you need 150 days to do what we call a partial environmental assessment report. So this is, this is, this is a challenge that we're facing. What happened is typically, if you have a logging concession or you have a, you know, you have a plantation concession, you, are, you have to do a full environmental assessment report. But given that this is a restoration that has no negative impact, then the minister told us to do a partial environmental report. Then the problem begins. 
the local government, the provincial government said, that, no, 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 we don't take that. We only take full, assess full environmental assessment report. Then there's a problem in communication already. Information is not flown well. The mandate was clear. Unfortunately, it took literally us about a year, uh, maybe nine months, to finally get that partial environmental assessment report uh, sort of approved to be processed after the fact that the Minister of Environment had to send a letter to the, gov the governor saying that for this particular license, you don't need full environmental assessment report. So then, you know, then we have. So we thought that, okay, we, you know, we, we, we clear that hurdle, we, we want to move forward. And then next thing you know, once we want to do that partial environmental assessment report, the district government said, no, 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 we have already allocated some of the area for palm oil, which is a very typical thing in Indonesia. You know, the, the, the district government is not talking with the central government and we are in between. So finally, not until the moratorium map you know, the moratorium has been signed by the president and the, finally the district government said, okay, since this is moratorium, then I'm not going to go forward. So that's where we are, you know, if you look at the top, the middle top, February 2012. So we think that, you know, the, when we have a problem with the district, now we, the, our epic, once we're done with that part, we get our partial environmental assessment report approved, then our application sent back to the Minister of Forestry. Then you think that it should be walk in the park. It should be easy, you know, because it's supportive, Ministry of Forestry, you know, uh, all these things. So if you look at February 2012, our recommendation from the Ministry of, uh, from, the, from the district or provincial level, arrived actually in Paiman's desk. But the same month, Paiman did that. So he, what he did, he, you know, he, he, he actually wrote a letter to the, another the Director General Pranology to start ri writing the map. So things are moving very fast then, you know, February 2012, April 2012, you know, basically the director general people, I mean, a lot of um, um, people are supporting us from Minister of Forestry, including the director general of production forest like Pak Iman, Planology, Pak Bambang Supianto and everybody. So by June 2012, we already managed to get our application with a map of 200,000 hectares sitting in the minister's desk. But nothing has been done since then. If you look at the time, it took June, just one signature is from June 2012 till October 2013. So if you look at the thing, I mean, it, it literally takes one year, four months to get it done. Just one signature. So again, this is about policy. This is about policy and basically being committed to what the policy is. Unfortunately, in the regulation, there is no time limit for the minister to sign or not to sign. There is a time limit for the director general to push the application, but not until when it's in his desk. So I guess that's something that we have to start thinking about being more transparent about policy, the governance of, you know, of, of, uh, of all this policy going. So, but again, you wonder why is it takes, why does he finally sign it in one year, four months later? And uh, it's the fact that after there's a media exposure and media pressure, then he signed it. So again, you know, this is not out of the blue, suddenly one month, one year, four months, I signed it. Because it's been sitting there for so long. And you said, okay, well, finally, because people start picking up about our project and there's a lot of media exposure part of it. And you say, well, this is great, right? There are so you finally get what you want. It's a, you know, even though you have to wait one year, four months, apparently not. The, the, the decree, the concession was signed in October 2013, but what happened? He only signed half of what he's supposed to sign. So this is the thing, you know, not only that you, you know, we, we've been following all the procedures, but it's not, but this is, this is real challenge of what we are trying to do here. There's a lot of, there has to be more transparency in the process of licensing. There should be better governance. And this is the issue that we have been facing and we've been facing for five years now. So. This is a small example in terms of the licensing problems that we have, which I don't blame anybody because there's a lot of things that need to be disseminated in terms of information. I mean, there's a lot of, there has to be a proof of case that we can be successful so more applicants should be granted license like us. So just to, to, to summarize, what the reality check is, the challenge, these are all the challenges that we have. I mean, you can see that there's a lack of understanding of Red Plus itself. 
I mean, we have been doing this for seven years, but people still don't understand. Some people just don't understand. And then there's no clarity in division of role and its responsibility between central and local government. This is another thing, and I hope that uh, the new red agencies can be just like the bridge, the broker that pa Iman mentioned. And I think the most important thing is they need to be a transparent and accountable process. You know, I just don't think that they're transparent enough in terms of getting all these things going. I mean, you know, being a private sector is being more transparent is actually better for us because that's, you know, we don't have to worry about things. So from the market itself, you know, in terms of getting this carbon credit or the finance, we just, you know, people are still, the credible baseline data is not there. And then, of course, there's a short-term and long-term, you know, return problem that we have. You have. The market is uncertain. There's really no, no real, I have to say, there's really no example that, that funding or we have received carbon credit or sales or anything like that at all. But even that, you know, with that is, I think, you know, we, we you know, as uh, PT Rimbar Mahmoud Rutam, our cutting and project, we, we are thankful to be part of the global comparative studies. But I think, you know, we have to put the theory into practice, just like Lou said. It's about, you know, showing that we can do. Showing what we can do and breaking the myth that, you know, all these things that uh, actually we can do, we can go for better governance, we can go for better transparency. Then we just have to develop a proof of concept. We have to make these things happen. Only if we are successful, then finally we can sit down and say, yes, we can do it. So I think uh, there are a few things that we, that, I that we can recommend by developing the proof of concept. We can, you know, actually have some kind of fund for early supporter like us. And then I think it's also important to build the technological capacity. And now, you know, just to give you uh, 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 information, we, our Katingan project would work with at least 12 stakeholders. Because working together with institutions like C4, even with Mesa Forestry, with private sectors, NGO, local NGO, I think that's how we can actually succeed in trying to make this Red Plus work. So. Um, I guess with that, uh, I, I wrap up my presentation. Thank you very much. For very interesting challenges. And I think that we have a, a, a nice progression through the, the, the talks here. Let me, before we take questions from the floor, do we have any, any comments or, or questions from the, the online audience? Technology. Um, combination of three questions, uh, mostly for Moira, as um, it seems like the success of Red Plus is uh, linked to the information flow. There were three possible solutions or suggestions that came, one from Brazil, they were up very early in Brazil. Um, how about linking funding to the information flow? No talk, no ciao. No talk, no money. So forcing or embedding in the funding the condition of uh, exchanging information with other parties. A second solution from Kenya, how about doing the same as what the UN did in humanitarian situations, go to the one UN solution, meaning channel all of the funding through one common channel and then from there on at the national level divide it. Or there was a solution from um, a Twitter user from Indonesia, how about increasing the efforts on populations itself? Thank you. I think that's an interesting solution, just force people to talk to each other. Although uh, it doesn't really work, you cannot force information flow by, uh, by requiring it, because it is already required. It is already uh, a part of being transparent, it's already part of being accountable. But uh, people, the actors also should realize that uh, sometimes they talk a different language and they need an interpreter. And so one of the solution might be to have better interpretation among these different groups. Do you want to comment? Do you want to comment? Does anybody else want to comment on that? Do we have some questions from the floor? We have a gentleman here and a gentleman here. Hello. Yeah, we'll, take two or three um, questions. We'll, we'll take two or three questions and then go back to the panel. So, so please go ahead. Go ahead now. Yes. Uh, my name is Bill Collier. I worked four years as an advisor to 
National Land Agency in Indonesia and now two years at Bapanas on another project. Uh, I'd like to ask about the Kawasan Hutan uh, forest zone, which uh, how does that, how does uh, one map policy actually impact on the forest zone? And as you know, the Kawasan Hutan in Indonesia covers 70% of the land of Indonesia, but recently there's been a constitutional court decision that stated the Kawasan Hutan did not fulfill the four requirements for a Kawasan Hutan that's in the law, and so far have only gazetted 14% of the Kawasan Hutan, plus Within this Kawasan Hutan, apparently there are 41 million hectares of land that has, does not have a forest cover. So who really controls, actually who really controls the land of Indonesia? Forestry, Kabupaten, government, and how does all of this impact on the map? Thank you. Thank you. Can we take the question from the gentleman here in the front? Thank you. Uh, my name is Haradon Bonik. Uh, I am uh, UN Red National Focal Point, Bangladesh. I have um, uh, two questions. One uh, to uh, presenter, uh, uh, second presenter. Uh, regarding the monitorium. Actually, um, local community depends on forest. And today also, I have, and uh, they, uh, if we impose monitorium, how is it possible to uh, execute red in the community level? Because they, are, they want to get something from the forest. So, and, uh, and uh, third uh, presenter about map issues. It is very difficult map. In Bangladesh also, uh, boundary issues, we are not able to sell the carbon to the buyers. So how we can solve these problems? Thank you very much. Thank you. Would you like to take the... It's very interesting question uh, about the Kawasan Hutan of our state forest area. But first of all, I would like to explain to you all that not understand very much about what Kawasan Hutan is and what Hutan is. Kawasan Hutan or permanent forest area is an area that is intended to be maintained and reserved as a permanent forest because of its biophysical nature that could be uh, what's that something like a production supporting system or life uh, protection system so we need to protect it as a kawasan hutan even though the area is not forested and it is the responsibility of the government to rebuild the kawasan to be again uh, back to the nature of the uh, forest and uh, yes it's true that the kawasan hutan of indonesia is almost 70 percent of the land total land of indonesia this is what i always say to my colleague in the ngo or in the government sectors that kawasan hutan of forest in indonesia is very very important land because no living creature in, in, in the planet can live without what's that, stepping in the land. And there is no production process that is not in the land. So uh, very often I said to my colleague that we have to change from the traditional forestry that's only giving emphasis, emphasis of production of timber, protection the flora and fauna and also protecting water and soil system but we have to think the contextual forestry for Indonesia which is it should be maintained 
and should be used as the production supporting system. Because 70% of the production, 70% of the living site is on forest area. So there is a need a safe or paradigm how we see in the, the forest. And then, uh, yes, it's true that the consentment of the forest as mandated by the Forestry Act, it should be cassetted until all of the boundary is marked by the poles and so on. But it's very, very long and costly process. So that's why before it's cassetted fully, uh, we, cannot, we cannot say that the Kawasan Hutan has been a permanent Kawasan. That's why in the former the former uh, act of the forestry act said that kawasan hutan is kawasan that is located and or gazetted as a forest but unfortunately in the mahkamah constitution what's in english mahkamah constitution constitutional court it's uh, considered as a non precise words for legal product. So they only say that the Kawasan Hutan, it should be gasseted. If not gasseted yet, it mean it not, has not been permanently uh, was that, decided as a Kawasan Hutan. That's the problem in forestry. That's why uh, with the enhancement, uh, enhancement of the technology, I always propose that we have to treat the Kawasan Hutan as the sea. We have no border, we have no boundary in the sea, but we have the, uh, what's that, uh, GPS and so on to say that, hey, you have been trespassing or something like that. So if we can use that kind of uh, policy, there is no need to, to cassette the, 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 the forest full uh, in, in all forests of Indonesia because it's very costly and it's very long process. That's uh, the, the, the phenomena of the Kasetman in the Kawasan Hutan. And uh, about one map policy. We did the one map policy in the, in the Kalimantan Tengah, Central Kalimantan, when we are implementing uh, red preparedness in that area. What we did there is uh, we try to have the one basic map that should be used and should be accommodated by all land-based development. There will be no map other than that basic map that is issued by the Baku Sultanal or uh, what's in the last name, PIG, but then informasi, geographical information agency. That should be the only agency that issued the basic map. This is the first uh, best, uh, basic map to be should 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 be used by all uh, developing agency, and then on this map, all the plan and existing investments should be depicted in that map. So there is no map of perkebunan, map of forestry, map of mining, but all investments should be should be depicted at that map. This is uh, in the purpose of uh, hindering the overlap in investment and also overlap of right between masyarakat and also other investment. Unfortunately, again, uh, we, we, we have satisfied with the, this, that achievement, but has not been implemented in the sense that not all agency knows about that. So what I said to the uh, colleague in the Kalimantan Tengah or Central Kalimantan Tengah, the map should be circulated to other agencies and it should be uh, a sort of socialization on what is the purpose of the map and how to use it and how to update and to correct the map. That's why, as I mentioned before, there's a need to have a protocol in updating and correcting the map. Thank you very much. We're just about out of time, but does, does, do we have a, a quick answer on the, 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 the community rights issue? Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank, that's a very interesting and great question. I think um, the idea is, um, you know, I realize, I mean, I have a banking background. So, you know, I, I used to work in Wall Street, and then I came back to Indonesia in 2004. 
I, knew, I realized that actually, you know, somebody actually, my partner, my business partner, Pak Rezal, who's sitting here, told me like, you know, I'm doing this business called triple bottom line. You know, basically you have, you know, profit, people, and planet. And I said, that's impossible. That was seven years ago when I, when I see him. Um, but I think uh, throughout the journey of our Katingan project, I realized the one way to get this succeed is to have full support from the communities. So community rights should be uh, listened and then should be followed. That's for sure. So therefore, the past, you know, as a result of what we believe in, the past five, six, even when we started in 2008, we have been consulting with the communities. So we have you know, to be transparent that we, have, we are a company that are transparent. We are a company, you know, basically we are equitable. We have to work, you know, show that equitability to the communities because they are the one that have the impact and they are the one who actually support and actually save the forest for us. And then thirdly, you know, everything is what we, what, whatever we do, whether it's private companies or, or communities has to be accountable. So, you know, with that transparency, equitability and uh, accountability, and a good communication, we can actually do this. So I realized um, this is the first time that, uh, that we start seeing a, pro uh, a business model that actually give benefit to everybody. Not just to the private sectors, not just to the government, but also the community and to the environment. Uh, unfortunately, it's easy and, and in theory it should work. Uh, but it's just not as, as, as simple as that. It's through a lot of process, a lot of, you know, basically with the four eyes that we talked about, there's a lot of different, you know, um, actors that has to be involved. But I, I'm personally very optimistic. The idea is, you know, we have to have a good success and communities will be the key stakeholders, you know, probably the most important stakeholders for us to be successful, even though we are private sectors, so. Very good, thank you very much. So, so equity is an important issue. It's not an intractable issue, but it, it's an issue that, that requires some serious effort and serious attention in order to, to, to overcome. We're about out of time, ladies and gentlemen, and so I want to thank you all for, for coming. Before we go, I, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. For those who are interested in climate change issues within the, the, the uh, uh, Forest Asia Conference, there will be another session in here just after the coffee break, um, sponsored by UNEP on um, building natural capital, how REDS can support a green economy. And just after that, in the final session, also in this room, there will be one on, uh, uh, sponsored by uh, UN ORCID and the UN RED program on um, seeing green and red, uh, sharing experience in equity and economics of RED plus pilot projects. And also in the next session, just after the coffee break, there will be uh, downstairs in Sudawesi room um, a, a, special, a, a section on um, managing mangroves. So, so a lot more to come on climate change in, in this meeting. and, and uh, so it, Please feel free to participate. But I'd like to now thank all of our panelists for, for the, the, the stimulating discussion and thank the audience as well for, for the, the, the questions and the, and the stimulation of the discussion. Thank you very much, all.